Who's happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Well, let's have everyone stand and just join me in prayer while we open up the service. Dear Jesus, we just pray for this amazing, glorious day that you've given us. Just the weather is perfect, and we're just happy to be able to praise you and just know that you're the God in the control of the weather, the good, the bad, the lows, the highs, and everything. We're just happy that whatever we do, it always belongs to you and that we could always fight behind you knowing that we're going to win the battle as long as we're following you. Let's have some fun and praise the Lord.
prosper when darkness falls it won't breathe because the God of sun knows only how to triumph my God will never fail oh my God will never fail and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war we wage is He will win And I'm not backing down from any giants Cause I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory Turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I believe, yes, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Done it for good. I believe it's true. Yes, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good, and I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord so I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna You turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you do. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I believe. Yeah. You 
take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good yes Lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good I don't know who it's for today We're all fighting our battles. We all have the things in our life that are, the enemy would love to bring us down and reckon us defeated in that area. Today we just proclaim these truths. The battle does belong to you, Lord. And Father, we know that the victory has already been won in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that redemptive power of the cross and the grave, which you just celebrated last week. Father God, you provided it all for us. But Lord, you require for us to come before your throne and present those petitions, those prayers, those requests, and our need for you. Lord, break us. Make us humble before you. You are the God of this beautiful weather. You're the God of the stormy weather. You are the God of your people. And Father, may you reign in these lives in a manner where we don't allow the outside to affect the inside, which you've already redeemed. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we proclaim these truths, may it be pleasing to you, may it be edifying to us, and may we say before the heavens, you have no power over us, because greater is he who is in us that is in this world, and we will fight the battle the way that our God has prescribed us to fight it, putting him in charge of everything we face. We thank you, Lord. Surrounded, but I'm 
surrounded by you It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you It may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you but This is how I find my battles This is how I find my battles this is how I fight my battles. This is how I well on my knees. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. You, Lord. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. One more time, I may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. But this is how I find my battles. But this is how I find my battles. But this is how I find my battles. But this is how I want more. But this is how I find my battles. But this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I. This is how I find my battles. Yes, Yeah. 
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, we just praise that name, that no matter how dark, how gloomy the day seems, we know that you will make all evil, all darkness fall and bow to your name, because we serve the God who's in control of the good, the bad, the light, the dark, no matter what circumstance we're in, he controls it all. That's the God that we serve, the one that has the power to make the waves stop, make the mountains move, and control the economy, control our feeling. Everything is in his hands. He holds the world in his hands. We sing that song as kids, but we don't really grasp it till we get older that he is in control of everything. He can make whatever he wants happen. He can make Mountains move, waves roar, calm, wind blow, stop. He's in control of it all. And when we say Jesus, when we say God, when we say Holy Spirit, Jireh, I am Lamb, the darkness trembles, the devil quakes, demons run. Just when we say his name, all evil shakes. They all tremble at the name of Jesus. That's why we sing that song. To light up our dark times, to see the end of the see the end of the tunnel, to make what seems impossible possible. That's why we sing that song. Because we know when we sing this song, when we sing any song, when we say his name, he makes what seems impossible possible. Heavenly Father, we just praise that name. We praise the name that's in control of the light, the dark, the good, the bad. We lift all all our problems up to you to know that when you touch them, you're in control. You lift that burden off of our backs. We just give you all our troubles, all our all our good times, our bad times, we give them to you because no matter what, when they're in your hands, they're better. We praise that name. Heavenly Father, we all say, amen. All right, well, you guys have a little bit of meet and greet. We're gonna just uh, have a video uh, playing shortly, but shake hands, say hello to the people that are late. Just make sure you look at them, give them a finger. Not that finger.
Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you can tell, I am not there with you. Hopefully you noticed. <laughs> um, hey, let me explain uh, where my wife and I are at today. Uh, our church board, uh, a, a couple of months ago, expressed uh, their desire to send uh, my wife and me to a, a place uh, in Florida called Care for Pastors. And uh, this is an organization that invests heavily in uh, pastors and pastoral couples and pastor families. And um, the, the board saw, and, and first of all, let me just say, everything's okay, okay? Everything's good. We are fine, but the board saw this as an opportunity with the uh, with the workload that we've had for the last uh, eh, number of years <laughs> that uh, it would be really beneficial for someone to pour into us. Uh, and so my wife and I are spending a week at this uh, facility uh, at this location where we will undergo uh, a number of hours a day of just intense investment into us. And, and what's uh, awesome is that this actually continues uh, even after we get back, and we'll be back this coming Saturday, Lord willing, uh, but this continues for several months afterwards too, over the phone and with uh, other methods of contact just to follow up on Annette and me and to keep on investing in us and keep on um, uh, strengthening us. And uh, I really want to thank the board publicly uh, for being willing to do this and to send us uh, uh, to this place. Um, uh, I'm still blown away by the board's generosity in doing this. And uh, so if you see one of our board members, express to them uh, just how much you appreciate their, their kindness and their willingness to uh, reach out to your pastors like this. This really is uh, amazing. So I thank them and I thank you for praying for us this week as God does something special in our lives as we um, uh, as we go through this uh, wonderful, wonderful time together as a couple. Now, uh, l let me give you some announcements, okay? Um, uh, because we just can't have a service without announcements, right? So here we go. Tomorrow, uh, the, the Golf League is scheduled uh, to have their first practice round uh, at 515 at Paradise Lake. So if you are part of the golf league, make sure you're there for that. If there is a change in that, you will be notified. So uh, right now, just proceed like it's going to happen, okay? And oh, Lord willing, maybe we'll actually get a Monday where we can golf. So we'll pray to that end, okay? Um, this Wednesday, I'm really excited that you get to hear uh, the ministry of George and Debbie Solon. They're, they're going to be uh, blessing you uh, with uh, a topic that they are really passionate about sharing, and, and that is the, the subject of love and the love of God and our love for one another. And so I, I think you'll be blessed by this. And so don't you dare miss this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Now, for our bowling league, your end-of-the-season banquet is this Friday. And so make sure you're there for that. This will be a, a kind of a funner time to bowl and get together, and everybody will get their prizes, and my team will be recognized for finishing in last place. I don't know what happened. I really don't. That's part of the reason why... I go to therapy. And finally, uh, do I have anything else? Oh, hey, yeah. Uh, don't forget, ladies, your Bible study is a week from Thursday. So it's not this Thursday, but it's next Thursday. So ladies, start marking that in your calendar. I know you're going to be blessed by that. Now, uh, we're going to enter into a time of giving. 
and uh, uh, Andy Cotton is going to minister in song as uh, you give. And perhaps some of you want to give in person. If that is the case, there's a giving box at the back of the room. Uh, right by the tech booth, the sound booth, and you could just drop it in there. Others of us have mailed in offerings throughout the week, and then still others of us like to take this time to uh, give online. Whatever the case, I want to encourage you to do so with a cheerful heart. And we're going to ask God, and I'm going to pray for you before Andy sings. I'm going to pray for you that God would bless your finances and that he would bless this offering. And by the way, uh, your special speaker today uh, is my brother, Matt. He is back. Can you believe it? You get Matt Anderson twice in one month. Wow. That, that's just incredible. And so he's going to bring forth the word. And uh, hopefully I'll have a job when I get back. Uh, maybe you like him too much. I hope. Well, I guess we'll see. But anyway, you're going to be blessed by Pastor Matt as he preaches Going to be blessed by Andy as he sings. Let's us bless the Lord with our giving. And please know that Annette and I love you so much. And uh, we'll see you when we get back. Okay, Lord, I just pray right now for this offering, God, that you would uh, use it for your purposes. And uh, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would uh, guide and uh, provide and be with every person, Lord God, who is in any kind of financial need. Lord, I pray that you would uh, fill those needs, meet those needs, do miracles there. And uh, Lord, take this offering and multiply it so that we might honor you and uh, just make you known throughout the Akron area. And God will thank you for what you do. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Something. 
So, man, this is nerve-wracking, actually, standing up here and talking and not singing. Whew. Well, I'm here to introduce my amazing Uncle Matt. He's my favorite uncle that's in the building. So, just, and it's his birthday, so. I heard that he loves it when you trap him in a corner and sing happy birthday to him as well, so. But thank you, we love having you here. I love you, so introduce Uncle Matt. Are we uh, dismissing kids at this time? All right. Kids, you don't have to endure me. <laughs> um, thank you, Jonathan, I do, I do appreciate that. Uh, I have a standard rule for the people in my life when it comes to birthday. Uh, whenever there's, you know, we'll be at a restaurant, and I, I just say, look, you do whatever you like, but they're not, there better not be a sombrero involved, <laughs> and we'll be, we'll be fine. Uh, so a little standard, uh, standard thing. So, yes, 38 feels wonderful, in case you're, in case you're wondering. It's great. At least I remember it that way. All right. Um, Thank you, by the way. I want to echo what my brother said. Thank you for the investment that you have made in my family. And uh, I did not tell this story last time. I was in the hospital in February. And, of course, Phil was there uh, being a champ. And um, it was, I think, my second day. And it was Wednesday at about 3 o'clock. And he's sitting in the room, and I, he looks at his phone. And he says, hmm. I said, what? What happened? And he goes, well, I'm getting texts from my board members. I said, oh, yeah? And he goes, yeah. They're all telling me that I should cancel Wednesday night Bible study tonight so that I can be here with you. And, and then he said, pretty cool, huh? And I went, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty rare, actually. <laughs> and... Um, and he, was, and he was freed up to do that, you know. And I never would have expected that, obviously. But uh, to me, it just, it says a lot about this place. And thank you, for, thank you for making their life good. He really loves you folks. You just, Phil and Annette just love you folks so much. Isn't it great to know you have a pastor who's not, like, looking for something else? This is, like, this is kind of it for him. He just, he loves and adores it, so... Thanks for being so great to, uh, to my fam. This morning, we're going to turn our attention to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. This morning, we're going to talk about prayer. And prayer is one of those things that we can know a lot about, but not do. <laughs> I know None of us want to admit that, do we? We're like, like no, I'm a prayer warrior all the time. Uh, but I think some of that can start in childhood, too. You know, we just have misunderstandings about prayer. There, there's an old joke of a little boy who asked his father, Daddy, does, does Harold really listen to me when I pray? And his father's like, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Who is Harold? And the son says, well, you know, he's our heavenly father. You taught us to pray our father in heaven, Harold be your name. So, you know, we just have misconceptions as kids. Unfortunately, though, there, and sometimes we see this today, there are those who will even mock prayer 
and say that we're wasting our time and we're praying to the great sky God or, or whatever. There was a, a farmer who lived out in the country and he actually went to a restaurant in the city in order to have lunch. Well, when he got his meal, he bowed his head and he gave thanks to the Lord. So an arrogant guy nearby saw this whole thing and saw the farmer praying and he yelled out, Hey, old man, out where you come from, does everyone pray before they eat their food? And the farmer, unfazed, replied, Nope, the pigs don't. <laughs> now we know not only from Scripture, hopefully we know from our own experience that prayer works. But our spiritual enemy is hard at work, and he is trying to get us to question the goodness of God and the effectiveness of prayer. At the least, it is amazing how surprised we get when the Lord answers. In our heads, we know he can do anything, and we sing songs like we sang today. But then when he does our anything, our jaws hit the floor. So today, I'm asking us to approach the Lord with confidence for something. And I want you to be thinking about it during this entire, well, listen to me, but also be thinking in advance, because we're going to have you pray about that thing at the end. Maybe something you stopped praying for. Maybe someone you stopped praying for. Maybe the Lord wants you to pick that back up again and remind you of the power of prayer. And as we do, let's prepare to do a couple of things. Let's, let's prepare to expect and to then give him the glory when he answers. So here's a great story from Acts chapter 12 that I hope will build our faith today. Acts 12, we're starting at verse 3. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, by that, folks, he means... He had James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, killed with the sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison... The church prayed earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel said to him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where they were gathered, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside. And told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James, a different James, by the way, and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. Title of my message this morning is Prayer Works. Who knew? And like everyone we're going to find in this story, we're going to make some great discoveries about prayer. And maybe you've come to a point in your life when maybe the prayer thing, it just isn't happening like it used to. 
I, I'm sure we probably wouldn't admit that out loud, but maybe you had a prayer that went unanswered or God said no. And it kind of soured us a little bit on, on the whole thing. I, I want us to be reawakened with the beauty of prayer today. And we're going to make a few discoveries about prayer. Here's one. Number one, it's never too late. It's never too late. So here we are in the story. Time is running out for Peter. He was going to be put on trial pretty much the next day, if not soon after. So let's remember, the first century was not like our legal system today. If Peter's trial was going to be anything like the trial of Jesus, not only would the trial happen that day, but probably the execution. So the church had to be just feeling the urgency of the moment. And Peter may have been facing execution that next day, thinking, wow, this, might, this is probably it for me. And the church is praying intensely for him. But they had to know time was running out. And throughout this message, what I want to do, I want to go through the actual hindrances, the actual obstacles that Peter faced. And we're going to parallel them to things that you and I deal with that can infect our prayer life. So we're going to take those actual challenges that Peter had to get through, and we're going to compare them to things that you and I deal with in our own prayer time. So in verse 6, we see Peter is bound by two chains. Each of those chains is attached to a soldier. Now, if you've read the book of Acts to this point, God has this funny way of getting people out of prison. They're like, we got them. They're locked in there. They're not there. What happened? You know? And uh, a lot of people were quitting their prison guard duties because... Uh, wasn't turning out well for them so they're not taking chances they've got peter strapped to two wrists to a soldier each they're not messing the angel appears though wakes peter up and the chains fall off can i start by talking about the chain of fear because this can really infect our prayer life the chain of fear can bring such horrible not results necessarily, but just turmoil within us. And there's a lot of ways to go with that subject. That's a sermon in itself. But within the context of prayer, I want to specifically focus on how we can start obsessing in prayer over hypothetical situations. In other words, we start to obsess over what ifs. Rather than focusing on what God might do, we start focusing on what could go wrong. And, in it, and fear starts to overwhelm our prayer life. I was watching a home renovation show one time. And I, that says something about my age, I'm sure. It's, I'm, 50, I'm now 54, so, and I don't even have a house, so I figured that one out. So they're renovating a house. And uh, the couple who had bought the house were away. They, they weren't going to see this process. Well, they get in, and they realize that they're in the ceiling, like the whole thing was going to rot out. And the second floor was going to collapse. And, but it was an expense they weren't anticipating. But they got, it, they got it fixed up. So they brought the couple in just to kind of get their okay. And the guy's telling them, now we caught it, you know, and we're fixing it. And the, and the wife just starts bawling. She's like, <laughs> and he, the guy looks at him, he's like, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she's <laughs> When I think of what could have happened, and I'm at home going, it didn't happen. How many times do we just go wacky crazy over when I think of what could have happened or what might happen? And it, it can ruin our prayer life. We can almost not ask at all. Because when we start to operate in the danger of what if, it will at worst keep us from praying or at best keep our prayers from being wholehearted. And we'll start hedging our bets in prayer. When we fear the future, we start hedging our bets. Pulling back spiritually, we start assuming that the Lord will not come to our aid. Or we start forming those little backup plans. All right, 
I'm just going to let that leave. That wasn't even in the notes. We're just going to let that stay. That was for somebody in the room. We need to take, though, those thoughts captive, those fearful thoughts, and not let them persist in our minds. Because it becomes a chain that wraps around us. Prayer causes it to drop. There are too many Christians that are living practically as atheists. And I think that the chain of fear is attached to the soldier of pride. When we're wrapped in fear, it's kind of all about us. And we start to find ways to just take care of ourselves. And we start getting those plan B's in our head, those contingency plans, just in case God doesn't come through. Or we just outright panic. Are there any panic people in the room? And you're like the lady on the home renovation show. And in a sense, we just take the wheel from the Lord. Like, okay, okay, that was good. Okay, I got it now. I got the wheel. So this part of the message is for those of us who are control freaks in the room. I am a recovering control freak. Is anyone in the boat with me? Any recovering control freaks? You control people just try to control even that response. You're like, I'm not going to let him have the satisfaction of no. In other words, I'll take care of this. God's obviously sleeping on the job. I'll handle this. And we refuse to wait on the Lord. Think about, folks, how many great stories you and I have missed out on. Because we took the driver's seat from the Lord. We roll up our sleeves. We try to look like we're doing something. We shove the Lord out of the way so that we can solve our own problems. And that's as prideful as it gets. Believing we can handle our problems better than the Lord. Prayer keeps us in the right position. Us in need, him in charge. Now let me talk about the the other chain here. The chain of deadlines. Boy, this can really mess up our prayer life. If you don't hear anything else, it's not even on the screen. Just write this phrase down. My too late isn't God's too late. I do. I love the story of Lazarus, who Jesus would raise from the dead, but it's what happens leading up to it that I find fascinating. Jesus is off doing ministry with his disciples, and uh, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, who Jesus was very close with, they send word. They're like, Lazarus, he's dying. We need you here. And Jesus, feeling the urgency of that, waited two days. Yeah, he waited two days and then makes his way down. Guess what? Lazarus dies. And then Mary and Martha do a thing that we do. They do a don't take this personally, but. You ever get one of those? And then you dismiss everything that was already said in the sentence up to that point. You're like, now we're going to find out what you really think. And Mary and Martha could even come to him like, hey, don't take this personally, but, you know, you didn't show up and he died. It's kind of your fault. Well, here's how they say it. If you had been here, where were you? And now it's too late. It's too late. How many times have you and I thought that he's too late? My God, the payment says it's due on the 15th. Where were you? But maybe the Lord really wants to bless you on the 20th. We're just like, but it's got to be the 15th. (laughs) Or the earth will explode. It's too late. It is never too late with the Lord. And what a story they got because Jesus took his time. We're, we're hoping for a healing. He may have a resurrection involved. We just don't know. But my too late is different than his. And we can start to get ruled by artificial dates. God will not be ruled by them. I'm not saying he doesn't care about what we're facing. He's just bigger than my due dates. Don't panic when he doesn't hurry. He's not a hurrier. Have you noticed that? You notice he's not like, oh, man, I better get on that. Not quite his style. Just pray. 
leave it in the Lord's hands, watch the chain fall off. And the chain of deadlines is linked to the soldier of natural thinking. That's what is attached to this chain. Our vision becomes spiritually impaired. We begin to only see things in the natural, completely bypassing the supernatural. We stop believing for possibilities. The calendar or the clock become the final authority instead of the Lord. You know, honestly, this was King Solomon's problem later in his life. When he, re- when he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you get that into your devotional reading, I'm going to invite you to maybe have an espresso. Why? It's a depressing book, is what I'm trying to tell you. Solomon's at the end of his life, and he's wondering what was the meaning of all this. That's basically what, a lot of what the book says. But he uses this phrase consistently, under the sun. The most famous one being, there is nothing new under the sun, right? And, and it's a quotable phrase, and it's true in a sense, but he's very cynical at this point in his life. And he uses the, the phrase under the sun some 20, 30 times in Ecclesiastes. What's the problem with that? Under the sun is what you and I can see. That's the problem. When you and I are only living under the sun, we're just seeing and experiencing things with our senses. There is this whole other thing going on in an invisible world where God is working. And we've got to remember that, even though we don't see it. I think that's something called faith. We have to understand that that is actually happening. Here's a great prayer tip, I think. It's great to pray through intimacy. In other words, when we take the time to be really close with the Lord Jesus, we kind of get past our natural hesitancy to ask. Some of us are bad askers. It's not that the Lord answers the prayers of those who pray a certain length of time. We'll just be more likely to ask him because it's out of relationship rather than looking for human answers when we've got that intimate relationship with Jesus. And we'll realize he's the master of all time. He'll take care of us because it's never too late. Second discovery, number two, it's never too big. Whatever it is that we're praying for, it's never too big or never too hard. That's what the, I just looked at the screen. It's never too hard. When your notes don't match the screen, it's never too hard. I want to be reminded of the size of this need that the people are praying for right now. The Jewish leaders had seen prison escapes before. We just talked about that. Peter now is in the innermost part of the prison with untold numbers of soldiers standing guard over him. Four squads of four soldiers. Do your multiplication table. Sixteen soldiers. They are not taking chances. No one could get through all of that. This is too hard. Too big. So when Peter is awakened and he is freed by the angel, Peter put on his sandals and his robe, and the angel began to lead him out of the prison. After the innermost prison, they had to get past two guard posts with all of those soldiers stationed. By the way, have you noticed how little Peter has to do with this? He's like, wake up, get up, put stuff on, walk. There's no like grant. He's not quoting scripture here, folks. He's like, oh, uh, uh, oh, chain off, me walk. You know what I mean? That's pretty much what's going on here. But can I talk about the guard post of hopelessness? Because the task was bigger than the people who were asking. I guarantee everyone in the room either has had a need like this or does have a need like this right now. It's just big. It's really, it's it's hard. My guess is that attached to that big need is a number. It may be a number related to our job. Maybe we have a sales goal we're under. 
some kind of a commission check we need to get, a specific target or a standard that's set by those above us if we wish to stay employed. It may be a medical number. It could be a white blood cell count. It could be a sugar glucose amount. It could be blood pressure, body mass index, which is from the devil. And <laughs> look it up. It could be a number on a scale. Or for many, it's probably got a dollar sign attached to it. It might be utility bill, mortgage, rent, debt payment, or, or, or amount needed to take part in something, like an entrance fee or cost. And we're, we're trying to get our kids into that thing. It's a number that wakes us up at 2 a.m. and demands our attention. But it can all just lead to hopelessness. Numbers can really mess us up and overwhelm us. They can steal hope. They can steal joy right out of us. But prayer changes our focus from an amount to the Almighty. Prayer will bring hope alongside because we have connected to someone bigger than us. Bigger than the number that haunts us. Prayer connects us to our big God. So what are we focused on? Our opponent or the omnipotent? So don't let the numbers get to you. Can I, can I just give you some scriptural numbers? 190. The ages of Abraham and Sarah when they finally had a son. 450. That's the number of prophets uh, of Baal that Elijah took on single-handedly with God answering with fire. 1,000. That's the number of enemies Samson took down using only the jawbone of a donkey. 5,000. The number of men, not counting women and children, who Jesus fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. Tens of thousands. That's the number of Midianites defeated with Gideon's small army of 300 and no weapons. 180,000. There's a number. The number of Assyrians wiped out by an angel of the Lord with a wave of his hand. One or perhaps two or three million. The number of Israelites God fed on a daily basis for 40 years with food from the sky. It's just a number. Don't get hopeless. I've never known God ever to go, whoa. He never says, whoa. <laughs> They're like, whoa, man, oh, man, what are we going to do? Right? He's not, numbers mean nothing to him. Nothing. But you are important to him. A number is just that. So don't, don't feel hopeless because God owns it all. He knows and he cares. And then also there's the second guard post here of intimidation. The guard post of intimidation. Large things, things that are really hard can make us feel really small. They just engulf us. We look at those things and we go, Oof, where do I start? And when we're beholding God's creation, that's very appropriate. But inappropriate when we're faced with a big prayer need. It may be our, our own worthiness that creeps in. Why would God do this for me? I haven't exactly been great with my devotions. Or it may be the enemy trying to keep us from praying by reminding us of our past. Reminding us of our imperfections. He might tell us that God is far from us. This is our mess, and you got to clean it up, dude. He's got better things to do. The need is too big. It's too hard. And we, we just shut down. We feel so intimidated by it all. And it can keep us silent. I think the way we get past this guard post is by opening our mouth and asking the Lord, pleading for his help in this very big situation. There's something, folks, official that happens when we say it and when we say it passionately. You know the, the Lord's Prayer Scripture? 
the disciples had said, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. And Jesus replied, when you pray, say. Not think, not ponder, not meditate. Say it. Say, our Father who art in heaven. There's a reason for that. There is something about when you and I say it. And sometimes, you know, faith comes by hearing, doesn't it? Hearing by the Word of God. Sometimes I need to hear me say it. Have you ever tried reading Scripture to yourself? Oh, man, do that if you can. There's something really powerful about that. And now it's not just a mental exercise. Intellectually, you take in the Word of God here today and ponder the deep things. Of... Boy, just say it. The reason Scripture was written in the first place was for a public reading of the Word of God. And I think you and I saying it strikes a blow. We're planting our flag in this situation. And we're saying, mm, here's where I land, right here. So I would invite you to, to use your voice. And then another prayer tip I give is pray specifically. When we pray for ourselves or on behalf of somebody else, be specific in what they need from the Lord. Let, you know what? If we're praying for healing in somebody, for physical need, let's not just pray for the symptoms to go away. If someone's going in for some kind of a, a, a surgery, a procedure, a simple procedure, which you know the old joke, right? What is a simple procedure when it's done on somebody else? But someone's going in for a procedure. And a lot of times we'll, and there's nothing wrong with saying this, but before we pray for God to guide the surgeon's hands, why don't we pray for God to like eliminate what's going on in there and take it out? Think, let's think big in our prayers too. Let, let's think the same. Let's think bigger than, you know, oh God, just get them through it. Shoot higher. Try to shoot a little and be specific. Look, if, if you're needing a new vehicle, tell the Lord what you need in that vehicle. Like, Lord, I really need something that has good mileage, that has this and this and this. I'm going to be on the road a lot. God, I really I need cruise control. I need. And you're like, oh, God, that sounds weird. Well, do you need it or do you not need it? For whatever you're needing, just tell the Lord what you need. And then just say, okay, God, now whatever you want to do with that is great. But here's, here's what I think I need. He's all right with that. He's like, well, someone's gotten picky. <laughs> he likes to know what we think. He likes to know what's going on. He loves to answer. I know it sounds petty, but it really isn't. I ran across this, this quote by William Copper who said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on their knees. The last discovery that we'll make is that it's never too tough. Whatever it is. This deliverance from prison, are you kidding me? Try to map this one out. Just see if the disciples are, okay, we're going to break him out. <laughs> okay, who's got a schematic of the prison? Okay, now you've got to get through the, the, the main the prison, and then the prison in the prison, and then, then, the, then the inner prison of the, of the inner prison. You got, everyone got that? Okay, we're going to have to get through about, I don't know, 300 guys. Who's up for it? And they, they just knew it was way beyond their ability. They knew it. So many moving pieces on the board. Surely nobody could have handled it at all. It was just all too complex. Too many soldiers, too many chains, too many gates, all too many variables. No point in trying, right? But Peter is now only a couple of doors away from safety. But he would have to get past this incredibly huge iron gate. 
that literally sectored the prison off from the rest of the city. Superhuman strength would be required. Peter was so close, but yet still so far. But because of the prayers of the saints and the work of the Holy Spirit, like a door at Walmart, it just opened up for him. So let me talk to you about the iron gate of complication. Some problems in life, they're not time sensitive. They're not even terribly sizable. They're just complicated. And usually this involves relationship. There's just too many layers to it to even be able to properly express it. It's just too long, it's too long of a story. It's too involved. You don't want to hear it, right? We even do that to the Lord. Oh, you don't want to hear all this. <laughs> it's usually relationships in this area. Too much bad history, too many bad words said. Too much water under the bridge. It'll never be what it used to be. It'll never be what it should have been. And our problems seem incredibly complex. But God's power is delightfully simple. And when we choose to pray for clarity, for reconciliation, for healing in relationships, the Lord does have this way of cutting through all the layers of drama and misunderstanding and rumor and bad communication to help us find uh, understanding. We can all relate to this. We all have a few people in the graveyard of a relationship. And every time we pass by the headstone, we go, oh, and the thought, you know, the thought that that could be fixed or healed at some point, we're like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks for that. But we've already said it's never too late for the Lord. And uh, uh, I remember, and, and I, I'm sure my brother has spoken about our dad from time to time. He was a complicated guy. And he never gave his life to the Lord. And there was a long season of time, I think for both of us. For me, it was like 13 years that I didn't speak to him. And I had, I had to just come to some conclusions. I just realized one day I was the only one trying you ever realize that in a relationship? And you're like, I think a relationship is kind of a seesaw. You need two people for it to work. Right? And I'd be sitting at the bottom. It's now moving. And I realized that I can't do all the caring in this relationship. And it was hurting me too much. It really was. And so I just backed away emotionally. I just thought, well, Lord, I don't know. And it went like that for 13 years. And sporadically, you know, I pray for dad. Um, and then one Saturday, one Saturday afternoon, I'm watching college football. And my phone lights up with my dad's name. I threw that thing down like it was a hand grenade. I went, ah! I literally did. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, ah! 13 years, come on now. Where do, you, where do you start? And I just let it go to voicemail. And I spent the next three days going, Jesus, what do I do? What do I do? And even in my dad's unredeemed state, he recognized that it was a wrong thing to have no relationship with his sons. And his, his second wife had passed away. And so he, he called me up just to see how I was doing. And that actually led to, I, he was only alive for about another two years after that. But it led to um, somewhat regular phone calls back and forth. And just conversationally, I was <laughs> he was telling me what it was like to live as a single guy. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> Never thought I'd have that conversation. But, uh, but the Lord somehow worked through that mess and uncomplicated and undid all the knots. 
right? And if you've experienced that in your life, you know only the Lord can do stuff like that. Only the Lord can do stuff like that. Where you have that thing and it's just, it's tied in on itself and you can't, you, you just can't un, undo all that stuff. And you just go, oh, it's not worth it. And then the Lord goes, poof. And it's all like flattened out. Wow, look at that. And maybe you do have a couple people in your life and you really miss them. And for some reason it ended badly. And you're thinking, yeah, but it's just so complicated. I know. But isn't it funny what we tell God is complicated? <laughs> he kind of made everything, folks. <laughs> We're like, no, really, this is complicated. <laughs> He's like, okay, if you say so. But if reconciliation isn't possible, the Lord will give you necessary healing to help us move forward with our lives too. But in other situations, he has the ability to bring people back together again. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And when I pray, I become aware of my shortcomings in a situation, and I offer apology. When I pray, I become aware of my need to forgive, and I do so, and the iron gate opens up for me. I did a, a fast at the beginning of the year. Maybe you did too. And uh, I went into it with no agenda. I just said, okay, God, I'm not looking for anything here. You, you show me the game plan. And boy, day by day, he was showing me that I was an angry little dude. <laughs> He's like, you need to forgive these people. Oh, and then you need to forgive him. Oh, then you need to forgive them. Oh, and did I mention? You need to. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Boy, it was, it was a really deep work that he needed to do in my life. And even though it didn't change any of those relationships, it changed my perspective on those relationships. And I was able to just release it. And really, forgive means let go. And I just, instead of holding the helium balloon, I just go, and I watch it drift and get away. And then the door of unbelief. This is the last obstacle Peter had. Now only at this point does Peter wake up and realize this is really happening. He's been set free. And realizing this, he goes to, the house, he goes to where the, the, the church is meeting. He knows where the Christians are praying, and it's at Mary's house. And it, apparently her house was a large one, and it had a passageway from the street into the inner part of the house where the Christians would have been praying. And a slave girl named Rhoda answered the door. We can assume they were wealthy. And it had to be a regular meeting place for the believers and a special place for Peter as he ended up leading Mary's son, Mark, who later wrote the gospel, to salvation. So Peter knocks on the door to the passageway Rhoda recognizes his voice because there's no peephole going on. Recognizes his voice and she's like, oh, oh my word. And she <laughs> leaves him there. She goes, Everybody, you won't believe it. Literally. You won't believe it. Some are like, uh huh. Yeah, maybe it's his angel. Thanks, Rhoda. Do you mind? We're praying for Peter to get rescued, okay? Not only, uh, you should note that this is the only time Peter has any resistance. Isn't that awful? He has no resistance until he gets to the church. Oh, no, that's a, isn't that a horrible thing? A horrible thing. He has, nothing stops him until he gets to where the Christians are. I don't know why God puts up with us the way he does. But let's not be too hard on these people. They had just seen John's brother James killed with the sword. So we'll cut them some slack for maybe not being the most welcoming initially. And we never know how the Lord operates, but we just always have to believe. Folks, we have to believe. As Jesus once said, everything is possible to him who believes. This is what God had to work with, though, that night. A church that was praying but not really believing. 
And God still answered. Isn't that great? <laughs> I don't have to get it all right. I don't have to have like mountain moving, you know, whatever that is. God somehow takes that little thing and says, okay, let's do it. Believe that he loves you. Believe that he has all things at his command, as Jonathan prayed earlier today. Believe that God will answer prayers that fit his will and in the right timing. Believe that your prayers are making a difference. When I, uh, I was the speaker for a young adult ministry for about eight years. And we, we had a young woman, and every Tuesday night, man, we didn't know what was walking through the door. And we had people show up drunk, high, you just, every lifestyle you could imagine. But we prayed for that. We said, Lord, send them. And, you know, he, answer, he loves to answer that prayer, by the way. And then it's our job not to be freaked out. Anyhow. And so a young lady came in, and, and she was hooked on heroin. And she had been abused by her her boyfriend and suffered tons of injuries that she would have to get medical attention for for years and years and years and years. And she gave her life to Christ, which was awesome. Um, but soon after that, uh, she went back. She went back into the life, and she showed up one night completely high. And we're like, "Will?" And she came up for prayer at the end. And I said, uh, Jamie, how can we pray for you tonight? And she's like, I relapsed. I went, mm-hmm, yes, you did. And we would pray over her, and, but she ended, up, she ended up gaining victory in her life. She established a strong root system in her life. She came every week, and she was experiencing some amazing things. And then she told us that she had been diagnosed with hepatitis C because she had uh, shared drug needles when she was in that culture. And hepatitis C can be life-threatening. And uh, so we just decided, well, we're going to do something proactive about this. And so we called her forward, and I asked for all the ladies in the group to come up and lay hands on her. And we prayed the prayer of faith over her. And I really... I. And nothing wrong with doing this at any time, but I really was strongly urged by the Holy Spirit to do this. And uh, she was going back for sort of a follow-up continuation thing with the doctor the next day. And I received a call from one of our leaders, and she goes, hey, I just talked to Jamie on the phone. She went to the doctor. There's no hepatitis C anymore. It's all been taken away. Folks, we got to believe how many of you out there, you can believe for somebody else, but then when it's for you, suddenly it's, oh, I, uh, uh, and we hem and haw. Boy, if it's somebody else, we're like, Lord, right now, Jesus, right? We're like a televangelist when we pray over somebody else. But when it's for us, we're like, God, there's no reason why you should do this for me. I've been a horrible president, Right? And we become shrinking violets. Same God, same power, same everything. Same love, same grace, same everything. We call ourselves believers. It's time for us to believe again in the power of prayer. Would you bow your heads, please, this morning? We'll ask uh, Jonathan's going to come back. I said this at the beginning. What's something that you've been praying for and maybe you stopped? Or something you haven't even brought to the Lord because you just think. I mean, I'll be specific here. You're in such a financial hole. It's in at least six figures. And you're saying, I'm such a failure. I can't believe I put myself here. There is no reason why God would help me. I want to tell you, my friend, you're wrong. The Lord still loves you. The Lord cares. He knows that we are people that sin. 
And he is more than willing and able to pull you out of that. Do not disqualify yourself from the power of God. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord. And maybe it's a family situation. Maybe you have a son or a daughter and you're at odds right now. And the more you try to fix it, the worse it gets. Maybe it is a financial problem. Maybe it's a a physical thing that is so big. And you've just resigned yourself to, uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. It's never too late, my friend. It's never too big. It's never too tough. Never. Never. If God could rescue somebody out of hundreds of soldiers, he can rescue you and your thing. So Jesus, right now, as I pray for this church, I hope and pray that everyone within the sound of my voice is taking something off the shelf that they've dismissed, something that they thought is over, and they're going to bring it back and say, Lord, I need to believe again. Like a man whose son was demon-possessed, Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What a great prayer to pray. Jesus All through this room, I pray that people are bringing needs to you. And they are going to pray with faith and authority. That they're going to pray that in the authority of the name of Jesus and by the authority of his blood. Lord, heal bodies in Jesus' name. Someone in the room with a chronic condition. Lord, I believe you can remove tumors. You can heal joints. You can... Take care of arthritis. Lord, maybe we've said, this is the cross I have to bear. But Lord, unless you've said that, we're going to pray for it. Lord, remove those things. For those who are in financial bonds and they just feel like they can't get out, oh God, do something so marvelous. We know it was you. Let us give you glory. Let us tell the story to someone else. We just need to believe again. For those who have a relationship that's so in the past or they feel like it's it's over and it's never going to get fixed, Lord, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing. So Lord, help us just to be in a place to receive that. I pray that you'll move in the other person, that maybe it'll spark a phone call or a text or an email that gets the ball rolling. And if nothing else, we just forgive each other and we move on pleasantly with our lives. Lord, bring resolution, if not reconciliation, to our lives. But Lord, more than anything else, help us to believe again. To really believe in this prayer thing. Because nothing is impossible with you. In Jesus' name, let's stand. I just want to pray a final prayer over you before you go. And obviously, if you want to take time to talk to one another, feel free to do that and bring love and joy to one another. Jesus, thank you for the beautiful day. Thank you for the gift of prayer. I'm so glad, Lord, that you've given us ways to communicate with you, to to ask for things beyond us. Lord, we humble ourselves and admit we can't solve our own problems. We can't fix these things. We trust in you. We rely upon you. Ask, Lord, and it shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, like Peter did, and the door will be opened. Bring faith to your people and to this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have an awesome week in the Lord.